In this video, I would like to talk about and derive the formula for the net electric field at some point due to a circular ring of charge. So here on the left, we have a perfect circle. I know it doesn't look like a perfect circle. I know it looks squished, but that's because I'm trying to draw in three dimensions here. But the idea is we've got a circle with a radius r, and there is some axis going through the middle of the circle at a right angle with the circle. And along this axis, at some distance z, there is a point, I've labeled it point P, and we want to know what the electric field is at that point due to the ring. Now normally when we're trying to find the electric field due to a charge, normally the formula is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, epsilon naught is a constant, times the charge, the magnitude of the charge, divided by r squared, where r is the distance between the point we're looking at, like point p, and the charge. But this formula only works for point charges. We don't have a point charge here, we have a full ring of them along the length of the circumference of a circle. So the method that we'll have to use here will involve some calculus. What we're going to do, we're going to use a very common method in advanced calculus problems, where we're going to take a small little element, a small little differential element of the circle, and we're going to call it ds, a tiny amount of the length, and we're going to find the electric charge due to that point, and then integrate it along the length of the circle. So you will have to know some calculus for this. We're going to, have to take an integral along the length of the circle, which means we're going to want this formula, this electric field formula, in terms of ds in order to integrate along that length. So because we can only integrate differential elements, I'm going to make a new formula called DE, the differential electric field. So this is going to be the electric field at some tiny, infinitely small, infinitesimally small element of the ring of charge. And it's going to be equal to basically the same thing, 4 pi epsilon naught, except the only difference is that instead of q, I'm going to write dq, since there's going to be some tiny change in charge at different, different elements of the length of the circle, and then the r doesn't change. And do we know that the r doesn't change? Because remember, r is the distance between the point we're looking at and the charge itself. So the fact that this problem is very symmetrical here helps us out because this r value is never going to change. And in fact, we can get this r value in terms of the variables we're given, capital R and Z, by using the Pythagorean theorem, because this is a right triangle. So this means that r squared is equal to capital R plus Z squared, so r is just equal to the square root of r squared plus z squared. But of course, the r in the denominator here is already squared, so we can just write this as r squared plus z squared. So this is our current formula, so it's looking a little more complicated now. But we still haven't done what I said we needed to do a minute ago, where if we want to integrate this along the length of the circle, we don't want to have a dq here. Remember, because these differential elements, that's the thing we're integrating with respect to. But we don't want to integrate with respect to charge, especially since, as far as we know, the charge is constant. The ring has a fixed amount of charge with a uniform charge density. So what I'm going to do here is define that charge density. And normally the symbol lambda is used for something called linear charge density. Linear charge density is the amount of charge that exists within some length of the, of the line or of the circle. It's the amount of charge per unit length. So another way to write it is dq over ds. Now as long as the ring has a uniform amount of charge, then this lambda is always going to be constant, which means we can rewrite dq as being equal to lambda, the charge density, multiplied by ds, the infinitesimal element of length that we're integrating around here. So now let's change our DE equation to include that. 
So DE is equal to 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught times lambda ds divided by r squared over z squared. So now this looks much better. Now we're integrating with respect to ds. We're integrating with respect to the length element, which means it's going to work. If we integrate around the length of the circle, then we'll be able to get a formula. But there's one final thing we should do first before we, before we start integrating. And this is kind of another neat thing about the symmetry of the problem here. Because remember, this problem is very symmetrical. We have an axis going straight through the center of the circle here, and this R is always constant, and we're assuming that we have a uniform net charge. But because we're doing that, there's kind of an interesting result here, where any vertical component of the charge is going to cancel itself out. Let's think about that for a second. So let's say that from uh, this, char like a, a charge or an amount of charge at the top here, point P is experiencing an electric field kind of pointing in this direction, where there's some vertical component and a horizontal component. And then, and then from the, the bottom of the ring of charge down here, the point is going to be experiencing another amount uh, pointing kind of in this direction, like this. So again, there's a horizontal and a vertical component. And if we kind of imagine ourselves doing this all around the length of the circle, then what we'll notice is that although all of the arrows are kind of pointing towards the right, the components that are vertical to one another, like pointing up or down, are all kind of opposing one another. Like the symmetry is so nice there that we can assume that the vectors pointing up are perfectly canceling out the vectors pointing downwards. This means that the only component of the electric field that we're worried about is the horizontal component, because the vertical components are canceling themselves out. So that's another very, uh, very nice and beautiful thing about the symmetry here. So the net electric field that we're looking for here is going to be just the horizontal component of DE. Or, a way to write that, is if this angle is some angle theta, then what we're really looking for here is DE times cosine of theta, because the cosine of angles like this is going to give us the horizontal component of that vector. So this is going to be the last step here before we integrate. So let's think about what cosine is. The cosine of theta, remember the cosine is equal to the adjacent side of the right triangle over the hypotenuse. And here the adjacent side is z. The cosine of theta is going to be z divided by the hypotenuse, which is r. So the cosine of theta is z over r. So we're going to multiply this formula that we already came up with down here. We're going to multiply that by z over r. But note that as we specified way earlier in the video, r is equal to this, the square root of big R squared over z squared. So we're going to have to multiply this square root here by the, the non-square root bit we've already got in the denominator. So let, let's see how that looks. So again, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times z times lambda ds, since the z is there now, and then small r squared times the stuff we had in the denominator before. And since it's the same thing, except we're multiplying by a square root, this time it's going to be the same thing r squared time plus z squared to the power of 3 over 2, 3 halves. This is because the square root of something is basically that thing raised to the power of 1 half. And then since we're being multiplied, that 1 half is being added to 1, since 1 is what we're basically raising the power to if there's no square root or no power being raised. So 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. So these two things being multiplied together add up. So we get big R squared plus Z squared to the power of 3 halves. So yeah, kind of, kind of a tricky thing there, but it's a sort of arithmetic that you want to get used to if you're going to be doing these kinds of calculus problems. All right, so now it's finally time for us to integrate. And fortunately, and you're going to be very happy about this, fortunately, even though this looks like a complicated formula, this is actually like the easiest integral on the planet. 
because the way we've set up this problem, all of those variables are constant, which means that we don't need to worry about doing any advanced integral methods or anything, since z isn't going to change, big R isn't going to change, that's just a property of the circle, epsilon naught is constant, we're assuming that the linear charge density is constant. The only thing that we're integrating is this ds here, which goes around the circle. So our integral here is just going to look like all the constants, 1 uh, over 4 pi epsilon naught times z lambda divided by, then to the power of 3 halves, big R squared plus z squared, and then all of that is constant, so it's pulled outside of the integral, the integral of ds. And the integral of ds is just s. But I'm not going to write out times s plus c or anything like that. Because we are integrating around the length of the circle. So this integral does have bounds. It's going around the circumference of the circle. And you might know, or if you don't know this, you can just look it up or try to memorize it, that the circumference of a circle is equal to 2 times pi times the radius of the circle. So we're going to integrate, our bounds of integration are going to be 0 to 2 pi r, since we're only integrating around the length of the circle. So if the integral of ds is just s, but we're going to be replacing that s with 2 pi r. So all we're doing is taking all these constants on the left here and then multiplying them by 2 pi r. So this is our formula for the electric field. It's equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times z times the linear charge density times 2 pi times the radius of the circle all divided by big R squared, the radius of the circle, plus z squared, the distance we're looking at, and all that is raised to the power of 3 over 2. So that's kind of a complicated formula, but that's what we would use if we have the linear charge density of the ring and the radius of the circle and the length we're looking at. So yeah, so I know this formula looks big and messy and scary, but this is the formula that we would use only if we know the linear charge density. If we don't know the linear charge density, then there is another way that we can modify this formula to include Q, the charge on the ring, assuming the problem gives us the net charge around the circle. Remember, the linear charge density is equal to the amount of charge divided by the length, which means that in this case, the linear charge density is equal to the charge Q on the ring, assuming Q was like the net charge on the ring of charge, divided by the length of the circle, which as we talked about earlier, is going to be 2 pi big R, since that is the circumference of the circle. So we can get another formula for the electric field by plugging this in for lambda, because what will happen is this lambda will disappear, since we're plugging this in for it, and then the 2 pi R here will cancel out with the 2 pi R in this formula and then we'll have a Q in the formula. So that will give us a new formula telling us that the electric field at the point is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times z times q, the net charge on the ring, divided by and the same denominator as earlier. So both of these formulas answer the problem. Both of these formulas give us what we want. The only difference is you would use the top formula if the problem gives you the linear charge density on the ring, but not the net charge on the ring. And you'd use the second formula if the problem gives you the net charge on the ring, but not the linear charge density. So that's it. That's the derivation. But there is one final thing I want to talk about and derive. Partly because I think it's just kind of an interesting result, but also because it can make this formula look even simpler in special cases. Let's say we're looking at a case where z, the distance between the point and the ring, is much, much bigger than the radius of the circle. So maybe you're looking at a diagram and you can see that the point is really far away, or maybe you're reading a problem and the problem mentions that imagine the point is super far away from the circle, something like that. 
In that case, for only those cases where z is much bigger than r, then we can assume that this term here, big R squared plus z squared, we can assume that that term is going to be approximately equal to just the z squared a bit. Because if z squared is the larger bit, and if it's much larger, then we can assume that the r squared isn't actually adding a whole lot. This is an approximation. This is not like an exact equality. This is only an approximation, but it is kind of a useful one, and I'm going to show you why. Because if in the denominator we only put in the z squared a bit, just that is being raised to the power of 3 halves, which means that these 2's cancel out. So now we only have a z cubed in the denominator, which is going to cancel out with the z in the numerator, and this is going to become a 2. And then the new formula is just 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the charge divided by z squared. Now this is an interesting result, and partly it's interesting because this means if you have a problem with a circular ring of charge, and we're looking at a point super far away from it, then you have this even simpler equation to use. So it's partly useful for that reason, but there is another reason why this is useful. The other reason why this is an interesting result is because if you look at it, you'll notice, you might notice that it has the same form as the, the normal formula for the electric field due to a point charge. It's just Q divided by the square of the distance between the point we're looking at and whatever is creating the charge. This is kind of interesting, but it also makes sense because if you're really, really far away from the circle of charge, then it kind of makes sense that eventually, at large distances, the ring of charge will kind of start acting like a point charge, because it'll kind of like look like a, a point charge in a way, if you're far enough. And it, and it kind of makes sense, it's kind of intuitive, but yeah, but, that, but that's an interesting result. But at the end of the day, these are the three formulas we've got. These top two are the exact formulas and can be used based on whether you have the uh, linear charge density or the charge. And then this bottom one is only an approximation in special cases, but is an interesting approximation nevertheless. So that is all for this video. I know this is kind of I know this stuff is kind of complicated because this is sort of a, some kind of tricky calculus that you got to do, but I hope it makes sense. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment down below, and I'll try to help out with any confusions. And if you have requests for like a future video that you'd like to see me make, then I've got a Discord server linked in the description. So always feel free to pop in there and send me a request if you have a video idea that you think would be a nice thing for me to make a video on. In fact, this video is actually made by request from someone in the Discord server. So that's cool. So I do answer requests. But, uh, but that's all for this video, um, and I want you to have a nice day. Bye-bye.